Welcome to video four for week three. In this video, I'm going to go through a number of examples of integrals in polar coordinates. So say I have the function x plus y and I want to integrate in the first quadrant between radius two and radius four. So this is what I called an arc in the previous video. The bounds for the radius are two and four. To get the first quadrant, I take the angle from zero to pi over two. So this is a nice region with constant bounds in both variables. And I integrate it this way I need to change x and y to their appropriate polar coordinate forms. x turns into r cos theta, y turns into r sine theta, and then I do the iterated integral. Um, make sure to include the Jacobian here. Don't forget that Jacobian term. Anytime you use polar coordinates, you need that Jacobian r there. So that's going to be r and r is r squared, and it turns into r cubed over 3. Evaluate on the bounds of r. Then I do an integral in theta. For all the integrals in this video, I'm not going to go over the details. I've put sort of a sketch of how the integral proceeds on the slide for you to check if you wish, but I'm not going to belabor myself with the sort of first year details of techniques of integration. All right, say I want to integrate over an entire circle of so radius capital R centered at the origin, this integrand. This is nice because this integrand also has a kind of circular symmetry, it has an x squared plus y squared term, which is going to turn into a radius squared term, um, e to the r squared. I have constant bounds for the radius and constant bounds for the angle. Since it's the whole circle, the angle goes all the way to 2 pi, and the radius goes from 0 to r. If I were to set up this integral in Cartesian coordinates, just for a contrast here, it would look pretty miserable. I'd have to go from negative r to r, and I have to go from the lower bound to the upper, or the lower arc to the upper arc of the circle. The lower arc can be described this way, the upper arc can be described this way. That's not a very nice thing to do. Those are nasty bounds to include. Whereas if I set it up in polar coordinates, things are really quite lovely. I have a simpler integrand. I have zero to two pi, I have constant bounds. And lastly, this actually has no antiderivative. Whereas this, because of this Jacobian term, is lovely. I can use the substitution u equals r squared with du equals 2r dr to do this single variable integral, and it's going to work really, really nicely. One thing also to point out, which happens a lot in polar coordinates, is this term doesn't even have an angle in it at all. If it did have an angle, but the angle term was multiplied by the radius term, I called those separable in a week two video. So I can actually separate this into two single variable integrals that I can do independently. This will happen quite frequently. Very often we'll separate out the angle integral if the function with the angle is multiplied by the function with the radius. So if you see me sort of pull angle terms out to the start or the front of an integral, I'm using the separability of the integrand after changing to polar coordinates. Then I finish this integral and I get what is really a fairly well-behaved integral that doesn't require a lot of fancy machinery, doesn't have these nasty bounds, doesn't have an integrand that doesn't even have an antiderivative to start with. I want to reference back some things that we did in week two. I talked about the volume of a sphere, and I set up the volume of the sphere in Cartesian coordinates with this particular, um, this particular Cartesian integral after a lot of work to try and figure out how to describe the volume of the sphere. But if I want to describe the volume of a sphere, I can think about the circle in R2 as 0 to 2 pi, 0 to R in R and theta. And then over top of that circle, this surface is cap square root, cap root cap sorry, square root capital R squared minus little r squared, because this negative x squared minus y squared turns into negative r squared in polar coordinates. So this is actually quite a lot nicer. And again, like the previous example, this has a situation where I have an r squared inside, and this r from the Jacobian term, never forgetting the r from the Jacobian term, actually lets me do a substitution for the single variable integral here. These are separable again, so I pulled this apart into two pieces with the angle piece separated from the radius piece. I do both the integrals and I get a very nice reiteration of the well-known four pi r cubed over three formula for the volume of the sphere. Similarly, the volume of the cone, shouldn't have had this piece over here, the volume of a cone, I didn't even do this in the week two video. I got to this point and said, this is sort of a nightmare. I've got to do a complicated trig substitution. But if I set this up in polar coordinates, 
then I, again, I can integrate over the circle in R2, 0 to 2 pi 0 to R, and then I can have the height function over that. And this squared x squared plus y squared, when I change to polar coordinates, just turns into an R term. So this turns into a nice polynomial integral. One of the themes that you'll see in this week and in the week to come with these polar and spherical and cylindrical terms is things that would have required trig substitutions now become really, really nice. And that all sort of fits together because the trig substitution is sort of doing something with the circle and polar coordinates are doing something with the circle. The polar coordinate change of variables is essentially sort of doing the trig substitution for us, but in a much more elegant way. Now that we're working in two variables, we have all that circle geometry available to us. We can change into a coordinate system that has the trig substitution sort of baked into it by the fact that the coordinate system is described by circles. So we get away from those annoying trig substitutions, change difficult integrands into easier integrands just by using this coordinate system. So again, this is a nice separable integral. It's a polynomial integral in R and theta. I won't go through the steps, but I get the volume of a cone with radius capital R and height H very, very nicely out of this. Whereas the integral that I had in week two in Cartesian coordinates, I didn't even want to do, let alone did I go through and do the steps. All right, I wanna talk a little bit about chaining some changes of variables together in this example. So say I want to integrate over an ellipse x squared over 4 plus y squared over 9. And say the function I wanted to integrate was the function x squared. Doesn't depend on y, but it's still a function of two variables. I'm going to do two consecutive changes of variables here. So first I'm going to do a linear change of variables where x, y are going to be 2u, 3v. The Jacobian of this, if you do the partials and the derivative of the determinant of the matrix of partial derivatives, you get that j equals 6. And if you put 2u and 3v into here, you're going to cancel off these terms. You're going to get u squared plus v squared equal 1. And this ellipse is going to turn into a unit circle. So even if the original setup doesn't necessarily have circular symmetry, sometimes there's another substitution that can turn this into a situation that at this point then I want to use polar coordinates to turn it into another integral. So this is going to be a change of two chain, a chain of two changes of variables in a row. So I start with the region D, I go from x, y to u, v to change it into integration over a unit circle. I get some constants that I pull out, so I get this integrand over a unit circle. Then I change u, v into polar coordinates, unit circle is 0 to 2 pi and 0 to 1. Uh, u, standing in for the x coordinate here, turns into r cos theta, so u squared is going to be r squared cos squared theta. There's my Jacobian term r of polar coordinates. And then I get a nice series of two integrals. This is separable. Again, I can separate the angle theta piece out and the radius piece out. I do both the integrals. And I end up that the integral of x squared over that original ellipse, which is quite hard to describe directly, through a chain of two changes of variables, a linear change of variables to here, and then polar coordinates to here, I can calculate that the value of this integral is 6 pi without having to do a lot of complicated integrals. All right, now I want to use polar coordinates for a slightly different kind of shape. And here we're going to get into a situation where we have polar coordinates with non-constant bounds. So I want a circle of radius 1, but I want it centered at 1, 0. That's not a very good circle centered at 1, 0. Let me draw that again. Yeah, it's a little bit better. And I want to integrate x squared plus y squared over that. So the integrand has a nice form. This is going to turn into a nice r squared. The equation of this circle, when I shift it over to centered at 1, 0, is going to be x minus 1 squared plus y squared equals 1. If I change that equation into Cartesian coordinates and I expand out this binomial, I get this. A few things cancel off here. The ones cancel. I get a sine squared plus cos squared term that adds up to 1. And if you solve this, what you're going to actually get is you can solve this to be r equals 2 cos theta. So the equation of this offset circle in polar coordinates, changing the Cartesian locus to a polar locus, turns into r equals 2 cos theta. And for reasons that I'm going to describe in the picture in the next slide, I can take that as the outer bound, whereas the inner bound for my radius. And here I have a situation where radius is actually going to depend on angle. So angle needs to be my outside bound, and radius needs to be my inside bound. I will have an integral and angle on the outside, an integral and radius on the inside for this resulting iterated integral. 
and the bounds on the angle that are going to work here are going to be negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now let me explain how the bounds work by using this picture. So here's the equation of this locus, this offset circle, r equals 2 cos theta. If I think about the radius in polar coordinates, the radius in polar coordinates starts at the origin, which is here. The center of this circle is offset, so that's not where the radius starts. So if I think about the radius, it goes out to the edge of the circle. So anywhere in this circle, the radius starts at 0, and it goes out to this arc, which is described by r equals 2 cos theta. So that makes sense that the radius starts at 0 and ends at 2 cos theta as a bound on the radius for this particular offset circle. What angles do I need? Well, all the angles out here don't have any points. The first angle I get is actually this angle going directly down, because as soon as I get slightly less than it, that angle going directly down, I get points here, and then I finish at this angle going directly up, because as I move across here with the angles, I stop when I get to something that's pointing directly up. So that's going to be theta is in, pointing directly down is negative pi over 2, pointing directly up is pi over 2. That's going to give me bounds in theta. The bounds in theta are constant, which is good because the bounds in R depend on the bounds in theta. Now I can put that all together. So this function over that region, these bounds in theta on the outside are constant. The bounds in R were um, were inside because they depend on theta. Uh, I wanted to integrate x squared plus y squared. That was the function that turns into R squared. And here I actually did in my slides what I always warn you not to do. I, I'm happy I left this mistake in because this is a worthwhile thing to mention. It's really, really easy to forget the Jacobian when you're doing these things. The most common mistake by far is people forgetting Jacobians. So we need that Jacobian. So this needs to be not dr d theta, but r dr d theta. So this should be r cubed, which is why we get r to the 4 over 4 when we take the antiderivative of r cubed. Then you finish this off. You do the r integral, replace it with the bounds in theta, so the r to the 4 turns into um, 2 to the 4, so divided by 4 is going to be 16 over 4 is going to be 4, and then cos to the 4, and then this is, I asked the computer for the antiderivative of cos to the 4, it gave me that. I evaluated on the bounds of the variable theta, and I finished the integral. Lastly, using something very similar to example 6, I want to talk about integrating over a region that's sort of composed of various pieces. So I want this gray region, which is the radius 2 circle centered at the origin, subtracting out this offset circle of radius 1. So I'm going to use the same description of this offset circle, and I want to integrate the function square root of x squared plus y squared, which has a very, very nice form over this. What I'm going to do is I'm going to call this circle d1, I'm going to solve this outside circle d2. So what I want to do is the integral of d2 without d1. But if you want an integral of something without something, you can integrate over this and subtract the integral over that as long as the function is well defined. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do the integral over d1, do the integral over d2, which is the whole circle, and subtract the two to get the integral over this gray shaded region, which is the larger circle without the smaller circle. So the integral over the smaller circle, I suppose I've labeled these incorrectly, so I actually want this to be d2 and this to be d1, so d1 without d2. So the integral over the larger circle is the integral from 0 to 2 pi and 0 to 2. That's a circle that's centered at the origin of radius 2. This integral turns into r. I did remember the Jacobian now. This is r dr d theta. Nice simple integral there. Just r squared turns into r cubed over 3. Do the theta integral separately. I get 16 pi over 3. So that's the integral over the whole circle of radius 2. Then I have the integral over the smaller offset circle. I'm going to use the same bounds as I did in example 6. The integrand is the same. This is an r. I get an r from the Jacobian term, so I get r squared. I won't s repeat the steps of that integral. I have to do the integral over r inside first, because the bounds of r depend on theta. Then I get a complicated integral in theta. Do that integral, I get 32 over 9. So the integral over the whole shaded region, d1 without d2, is the integral over the larger circle minus the integral over the offset circle, which gives me this in common denominator. Hopefully those seven examples give you a sense of sort of what's going on with integrals in polar coordinates.